Dear brothers and sisters, dear friends, welcome to the fourth presentation in the series of lectures for training in missionary work. Today I'm going to talk about Preach the Kingdom, the methods for witnessing and the gospel work. In the spirit of prophecy, it is written, the Gospel Commission is the great missionary character of Christ's kingdom. The disciples were to work earnestly for souls, giving to all the invitation of mercy. They were not to wait for the people to come to them. They were to go to the people with their message. When you think of sharing the gospel with someone, what comes to your mind? If you are like many Christians, stress might first come to mind. You don't want to hurt your relationship with the person, especially if it's a close friend, family member, or a coworker. Even with someone you just met, you might be concerned that they will be offended. And you want to avoid any conversation that might quickly turn awkward. You might also wonder if they're going to ask you a question you can't answer. And you feel bad that you haven't been able to help the person much. It's a horrible feeling. The scriptures say, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. We should be ready to preach the gospel to everyone we meet, at all times. One way to keep yourself always prepared is to constantly think about the fate of the unsaved. Think of yourself as a person living in the midst of a terrible drought. You have been given a supply of food and water to share. So how do you prepare yourself? You make sure you have food at hand for when you see someone who is starving to death. Our food is the gospel. In Luke chapter 24, we find a wonderful example of Christ's witnessing manner and method in a powerful post-resurrection story. Let's try to uncover some witnessing tips that can be gleaned from this one Bible passage, which can help us become a more effective and confident witness. Let's pick up the story in verses 13. To 15. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score farlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they commuted together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Drew near. Christ was not aloof. He went to where people gathered. He drew near and went with them. The root meaning of the phrase drew near is to come near in time and place. Christ sought out the hurting. While much of the gospel work can be accomplished from afar, ultimately, most people need a personal real-time connection. They need someone who will reach them where they are and become acquainted with them. They need someone who will sympathetically apply scripture to their specific situations. Verse 16, but their eyes were holden that they should not know him. 
What an interesting concept. Here, scripture indicates that the eyes of these two men were restrained and they did not know that it was Jesus. The Lord wanted them to be able to focus on what he was saying rather than who he was. Drawing near to people and witnessing to them does not necessarily require that the first thing we do is to adopt an in-your-face, full-disclosure approach. Sometimes much more can be accomplished if we remain, let's say, undercover and reveal things as souls are able to digest them. In John chapter 16, verse 12, we can read, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Listen to them. Another tip. Listen to the words people are using. Listen to their logic. When you are witnessing to them, you can learn much about who they are and what their needs are. This can provide a foundation and direction for what you later share when it is time to make yourself and your purpose better known. It is easier to tailor your teaching to their specific needs if you listen to their concerns and take them to heart. What did Jesus do to gather more needed information? He said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? We can find at least two more fruitful witnessing tips in this short verse only. Explore their hearts. Ask open-ended questions to better know your new friend, and get additional background. When you ask open-ended questions, people often don't feel pressured and will share what's in their hearts. They also feel valued because they're being listened to rather than witnessed to or preached at. But did you notice the other element in Christ's question? He not only asked about their conversation, he also noted and asked about what their facial expressions and body language were communicating. So, be aware of everything. Facial expressions matter. And they can tell a lot about what's going on in someone's head. It's never safe to assume anything based on just a facial expression, but it certainly does not hurt to ask. Jesus' question and observation drew a revealing response from one of his travel companions. Verse 18. And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Are thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and has not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? But Christ recognizes that it's still not quite time to speak. He hears within Cleopas' question the desire to share even more information. So he beckons Cleopas to continue by asking, What things? Verse 19, and he said unto them, what things? And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. Verse 20 and 21, and how the chief priests and our ruler delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, 
today is the third day since these things were done. Verse 22 and 23. Yeah. And certain women also of our com company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. Verse 24. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found it even so as the woman had said, but him they saw not. Did you see the reason for Cleopas' anger? He offered it. So what was the problem? These two were despondent and their conversation with one another was not helping one bit. It was only father depressing them. Bottom line, they had lost hope and were in a very vulnerable and discouraged state of mind. So, another tip, be patient. If you patiently wait long enough, people will often tell you their problems and give you a chance to offer a solution. What Christ said next will be of vital importance to them physically, mentally, and spiritually. It could very well be the difference between life and death for them. Verse 25, Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Here, the entire tone of this witnessing experience changes. Christ moves from being an active listener to being an active presenter of heart-saving Bible truth. Another tip, be direct. Once Jesus knew the problem and its seriousness, he wasted no time in directly but tactfully sharing not only his diagnosis of the problem, but also the solution. So be prepared to have an answer. Christ doesn't just tell them that they are thinking things wrong. He also shows them how to think right through a powerful explanation of Scripture. Jesus knew they were desperate for answers. You could say that he positively reproves them, offering them the correct view of the situation on the basis of Scripture. As Jesus explained this revelation, he does it in the context of his own personal pain experience. The things concerning himself. So, another tip. Make it personal. The most powerful form of witness is often just a simple personal testimony. You must learn to share your testimony whenever it is most useful to do so. Another tip. Give the glory to God. Remember, true witness will lead to the worship of the living Christ not the preacher or teacher. Keep God as your focus, just as Christ always did. Another example we have in scriptures is the example of Paul. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul outlines how he had an impact for the gospel during his short visit to Thessalonica. Paul's time in that place shows us some elements of an effective Christian influence. Verse 2. But even after that, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi. We are bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. 
a determination to declare the gospel. We can see here a strong determination to declare the gospel. Paul makes it clear that he faced tremendous obstacles in Thessalonica. We also face tremendous obstacles in declaring the gospel to others. We also face internal fears about being ridiculed or messing up. But God stands ready to help us tell others the good news. Verse 3, for our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guilt, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. A deep sense of commissioning. Paul is explaining what led him to tell others the gospel. It wasn't error. It wasn't impure motives to gain power or influence. Paul told others the gospel because that was his identity. He was commissioned by God to do it. Verse 4, so we speak not as pleasing man, but God, which tried our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words. Very important lesson. A desire to please God alone. Paul is not interested in pleasing people. This is why he mentions flattery in verse 5. Flattery is the language of people pleasers. Paul wasn't interested in getting glory from people. He had eyes only for God. Verse 7 and verse 8. But we are gentle among you, even as a nurse cherished her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls. Because you were dear unto us. What a beautiful lesson. A tender and sincere love for others. Just listen to how much Paul loved the Thessalonians. He's gentle with them. He was affectionately desirous of them. And he shared his life with them because they were so dear to him. My dear friends. If you want to influence others for Jesus, love them. Love them sincerely. Love them self-sacrificially. Love them generously. Let's talk a little bit about the fruits of your labors. When you share the gospel, you may have times when you feel like you're not accomplishing anything. Christians may come up to you and say things like, I led hundreds of people last year to the Lord. All glory to Him for what He's doing. And there you are faithfully laboring away and you haven't seen anyone come to the Lord. The Bible tells us that as we saw the good seed of the gospel, one saw us, and another reaps. If you faithfully sow the seed, someone else may reap. If you reap, it is because someone has sown in the past, but it is God who causes the seed to grow. Never be discouraged. Keep asking God that you may see fruit in your labor, but don't let seeing fruits now be your source of encouragement and motivation. Let it simply be the fact that God is faithful to watch over His Word. There's nothing wrong with the seed of the gospel, and it's up to God to cause it to bring life. In His perfect timing, you will see fruit in eternity. That's where it counts. Brethren, at the end I want to share the last paragraph with you. And may God help us 
to keep it in our hearts. Is the only method, actually, that will give us true success in reaching the people. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior, mingled with man as one who desired their good, he showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. May God help us to learn how to use this method alone. Christ method. Amen.